In the United States, most 240 volt appliances adhere to a common arrangement in the way that they power loads and controls. 240 volts is advantageous for electric heating because elements can produce four times as much heat at 240 volts than they can at 120 volts. An electric dryer primarily contains two 120 volt circuits and one 240 volt circuit. The main control and the motor are in this 120 volt circuit, which is derived from the difference in voltage between L1 and neutral. So you have your control here, which is powered by this 120 volts between L1 and neutral. You also have your motor. You can see this is where the circuit for the motor is. It goes through that relay into L1. So it starts at L1 and actually returns back to neutral. Neutral is your return path. Now the heating element is on a 240 volt circuit. As you can see, if we follow L1 through here, through this relay, and through the centrifugal switch of the motor, through this element, we'll end up back to L2. We will end up at L2, which is the return path. Or if you started here and went the other way, then L1 would be the return path. So the heating element is strictly on a 240 volt circuit, whereas the motor and the control board are on a 120 volt circuit, which is usually derived from the voltage difference between L1 and neutral. For an electric range, the control board again is powered by the voltage difference between L1 and neutral. And this is your neutral going to the control board. The return path is neutral for that. Now there are relays typically on electric range control boards that act as switches that complete the circuit between L1 and L2 through the, either the bake element or the broil element. So you've got two, you've got two 240 volt circuits here going from L1 through that relay, through the bake element, and back to L2. You have another one that goes L1 through this relay, through the broil element, and back to L2. Now, typically there are other safety relays in here, but these are simplified drawings to make it easier to understand. Now for what is typically four cooktop burners on an electric range, you have individual switches now, these aren't just switches, they're actually called infinite switches, which control the amount of time that the voltage is actually passed on to these elements. But they're just representative switches here for simplicity. And that, that circuit, those circuits go from L1 through the element and back to L2 for each of these circuits here. So let's take a look at 120 volt appliances. So with some exceptions, most gas ranges and dryers use only 120 volts. Heat for cooking and drying is produced by gas combustion. Thus, there is no need for 240 volt supply in most cases. Notice that the voltage to the gas dryer is derived from L1 to neutral. So you're just gonna have a power cord that has a, has a ground, a neutral, and an L1. The gas dryer consists primarily of 320 volt circuits, the main control, the gas and ignition circuit, and the motor. The motor and gas circuit are each activated by relays on the main control. The gas circuit also relies on a centrifugal switch in the motor to complete the circuit. This increases the probability that the blower will be pulling the flame through the funnel. The gas range will typically consist of four primary circuits. You've got your control, your gas bake circuit, the gas broil circuit, and then your spark module, which has four sub circuits, each controlled by a switch behind each burner knob that activates the spark module. Note that when a switch is closed for a particular burner, all the burners will actually spark. The gas bake circuit is energized by a relay that is on the control board. The gas broil circuit is also energized by a relay on the control board. Note that there may be safety relays in here, but this is just a simplified circuit diagram. Troubleshooting 240 volt appliances. Diagnosing 240 volt circuits is easiest when you avoid referencing ground and neutral in your measurements. This is because the circuit that involves the 240 volts as discussed before does not include neutral 
that actually ignores neutral and ignores ground. So neutral is not involved in the circuit and is not the return path. The return path for L1 is L2 and for L2 is L1. Note that L1 and L2 are of opposite polarity. If you were to measure L2 from neutral, yes, you would get 120 volts. Now, if you tried to measure L1 from neutral, you would also get 120 volts. Let's take a dryer with no heat, for example. And the reason it had no heat is because it lost L2. It lost this line voltage because maybe it had a loose connection at the terminal block or at the receptacle of the wall. The dryer would still run because all you need is 120 volts from neutral to L1 to power the control board and to power the motor. So this dryer would run, but it would have no heat. Suppose you went out on this service call and you decided to use neutral as a reference point to test for no heat. And this is why it's not really a good idea to do that. If you measure from neutral to L1, you will get 120 volts as expected because you do have 120 volts there. Now, since this dryer is missing L2, when this relay is closed and the centrifugal switch is closed, L1 is going to make its way through that relay, through that centrifugal switch, through this low resistance element and make its way all the way to L2. So when you get your meter and you're using neutral as a reference and you measure L2, you're going to measure 120 volts. And you're going to think that you have proper voltage at your terminal block when actually in reality, you do not have L2, you only have L1. Most field meters, multimeters, do not have the capability to distinguish between L1 and L2 because they're of opposite polarity. It actually distinguish the difference between L1 and L2. You would likely just you would likely need an oscilloscope to do that because you because these two are uh, what's known as 180 degrees out of phase. So that's why it's really not a good idea to uh, one of the many cases in which it's really not a good idea to reference neutral when you are troubleshooting 240 volt circuits. Now, how would you troubleshoot a circuit such as this, where this range has no broil? Everything works on this range, bakes and everything, but it just won't broil. But you've already done the basics. You've checked over here and you've got 240 volts from here to here. So you know that you have 240 volts available for the broil element. You've gone ahead and you've checked the broil element, the resistance, and it checks out. So the broil element is good. So now what do you do? So you suspect that there's an open circuit somewhere in here, but you don't really know what it is. So after doing those basics, there is a troubleshooting method you can use that I call the point to point voltage drop method. Basically, you're going to connect a reference lead right here and you're going to go through the circuit. And you're going to check for voltage drops all the way to the circuit. And when as soon as you find a voltage drop, you're going to go point to point through here. As soon as you find a voltage drop, you're going to know that the point just prior to that voltage drop is an open circuit. So let's apply that point to point voltage drop method on a specific scenario. Suppose you arrive at a customer's house with a 240 volt electric dryer with a no heat complaint. You do the basics. You check for 240 volts at the terminal block. You check the heating element. You check the thermal cutoff, the high limit thermostat, and the operating thermostat. All of them are good. The element has 10 ohms, and these all read about zero ohms. What you don't know yet is that this motor has a bad centrifugal switch. This switch will not close when it's supposed to. The centrifugal switch in the motor is supposed to close once the motor gets up to a certain RPM. And that again is to keep the heater from coming on until enough air is being moved by the blower to sufficiently pull that heat off the element. So at this point, you suspect that there's either something wrong with the control board, maybe a relay on it, or the motor centrifugal switch. So what you can do is use that point-to-point -point voltage drop method. And here's that method specifically. You identify the circuit. After you've done the basics, you're going to identify the circuit for your target load. But your target load is your dryer heating element. So you've identified that circuit. This will be the circuit right here. It's going to go from here all the way down through here. You're going to set your meter up, multimeter on AC volts. You connect one lead to L1 using an alligator clip. 
right here. This is your reference lead. And you're going to trace step by step through the circuit from L1 towards L2, towards L2, which is the return path in this case. And you're going to watch the voltage. Good components, except for your target load, should read close to zero volts. Once you reach 240 volts, the component just prior to your test lead is open and suspect. Now this is a live voltage test, so this is for qualif either qualified technicians or technicians under the supervision of a qualified technician. You're going to start your dryer in heat mode. You're going to take the other lead, the one that is not connected to this terminal block, and you're going to go to point B and you're going to measure the voltage there. Now in this scenario, you're going to measure zero volts here because that centrifugal switch is open, which means that there's nothing to pass this 240 volts through here over, over to this part of the circuit. So you're going to take your lead and you're going to measure from here to here. And you're going to get zero volts. You're going to check this, you're still going to have zero volts. You're going to check this, you still have zero volts. You're going to check this, you still have zero volts. What that has told you is that all of these connections are closed. The heat relay is closed. The operating stat, high limit, and the thermal cutoff are all closed. Well, you knew those were closed because you measured them with your own meter. But you weren't able to measure that because it doesn't it doesn't close until the dryer is put into heat mode. So now you know that all these switches are closed, and that's the zero volts. Now what you should have in this case is you should have 240 volts right here because the highest resistance, as mentioned earlier, in a circuit is going to have the most voltage across it. In this circuit here. If this centrifugal switch was closed, all these would be zero ohms. So this would be the absolute highest resistance. So this would have 240 volts across it. But you go ahead and you take your meter and you check there, you still have zero volts. Now take your meter over to point G and now you measure 240 volts. Now you know, and you have to measure 240 volts because you're actually connected directly to L2. Now you know that you have 240 volts from this point to this point, which means you have 240 volts across that centrifugal switch. It's impossible to have 240 volts across the centrifugal switch if it's closed. That means it has to be open. So in this case, what you would do is you would replace that motor. Once you replace the motor, then this switch will be closed and you're gonna have 240 volts right here. And the element will have, as it should, since it is the highest resistance in this circuit, 240 volts across it. Now this is just one of many scenarios where you can use that point-to-point -point voltage drop test. I also call this test a, a brute force method because what it does is it forces failed components to reveal themselves. Troubleshooting 120 volt appliances. That can be done much in the same way as with 240 volt appliances. Suppose in this case, that your broil circuit wasn't working. So you connect your reference lead to neutral, you come over here and you check point B with your other lead. You should have 120 volts here in a working broil circuit if this is activated, but you don't, you've got zero volts here. So you keep going and you go over here to point C. And you, when you're at point C, you detect 120 volts. Well, you should because you're actually at L1 over here. So this tells you that this over here, this relay is, is open. It's not closing like it should. You have 120 volts across and you cannot have 120 volts across a relay that has closed contacts if those contacts are good. So that relay is bad and either and this control board in most cases would need to be replaced. Now some technicians actually replace relays, but that's an entirely different topic. So once this, re once this control board is replaced, then L1 will make it all the way over here. You're going to have L1 over here, and you're going to have neutral over here. So this is zero volts, and you're going to have 120 volts. Now, there is some resistance in the gas broil circuit. And again, this will have the highest resistance in the circuit because this is zero ohms over here. This is supposed to be zero ohms. And you're going to have some resistance here. The highest resistance wins, and it's going to have all the voltage across it because it is a single, it is a single element in the circuit and of the highest resistance. That's it for this video. I hope you found it to be interesting and informative. 
Although learning how electricity works can be challenging, continual education and experience will greatly accelerate your knowledge. If you'd like to join our Facebook group, here is a link to it right here, or you can go to Facebook groups and type in the keyword, the tech circuit. This is a link to our website right here, and this is a link to our YouTube channel.